thank you, Yumi, for that uh, kind introduction. And it's nice to be with all of you on at least where I am in Connecticut, uh, an oddly warm uh, Friday afternoon. Uh, so the first thing I wanted to do, because even though I used Zoom a lot during the pandemic, uh, I've never used this particular part of it, which allows me to share just part of my screen. So I just want to make sure that what you're seeing in your full screen is the uh, slide that says visual culture in wartime Japan, but not any notes or not anything else. Is that right? You can say yes, because that's probably the easiest way. <laughs> yes. Okay. okay. Yes. All right. Thank you, then. Um, all right. So what I want to uh, talk to you today uh, about is, as Yumi was suggesting, um, World War II from uh, Japan's perspective. And I particularly want to use visual culture uh, from the wartime era uh, to illuminate uh, Japan's motivations for fighting this war. Now, when I refer to this war, uh, what comes to mind, I think, uh, in most of our minds is the term World War II. Uh, and when we hear the word World War II, we often think of a specific period in time, and that is from 1939 until 1945. Uh, but I would argue, and many Japanese historians argue this as well, that that is a particularly European-centered version of uh, World War II. And that if you look at World War II from a Japanese perspective, the time frame that is a more accurate uh, uh, version of the Japanese experience of World War II is what you see here, 1931 to 1945. Uh, in Japan, uh, this war uh, is often referred to as the 15-year war. And I think it's very important to include uh, this particular time frame because if we're going to treat World War II as truly a world war, that is to say uh, a global conflict, then we need to include Asia uh, and Asia's place in uh, this global conflict. So today then I want to talk to you about uh, wartime Japan from 1931 to 1945. And I want to look at the multiple motivations of multiple peoples, political leaders, military leaders, cultural figures to fight this war. Why was Japan fighting this war? Uh, I think the simple explanation that is often uh, circulating in the popular imagination is that Japan was fighting this war to dominate the world. Uh, and that's not an uh, incorrect uh, explanation, but I would argue that it's incomplete and it doesn't really render uh, enough complexity to the multiple motivations for why Japan was fighting this war. And I think one uh, way to get into uh, this question of Japanese motivations for war is to think about this question. Who were Japan's enemies? And I think I would first like to draw your attention to the fact that the word enemy here is plural. There are multiple enemies that Japan was fighting during the 15-year war period. Now, the first and probably most obvious to many of us in the United States is that the United States was Japan's enemy. Uh, after all, uh, the United States and Japan were at, at war from 1941 until 1945, what's known as the Pacific War. Uh, but that was not Japan's only enemy during the 15-year war. Uh, a related enemy, but in some ways a much broader one, was Western imperialism and the Western presence in Asia. Uh, many Japanese argued that Japan was fighting this 15-year war to expel Westerners from Asia and to unite Asians together uh, in solidarity. Uh, so Western imperialism is another enemy, but it wasn't just uh, this attempt to expel Western people and Western power from Asia, but it was also a war in which the Japanese were trying to expel Western culture from uh, not just Japan, but from Asia as well. And this, this goal of expelling Western culture is related to perhaps what is a fourth 
enemy that Japan was fighting against. And that is this idea of the Enlightenment. Now, the Enlightenment, as many of you probably know, uh, was a European-centered intellectual movement that occurred uh, in the late 1700s and early 1800s. And one of the things that Enlightenment thinkers were trying to do was to come up with natural laws, what they claim to be universal laws for how economies, politics, society should work. And once you come up with these natural laws, you begin to try to implement them within your own nation or region. Uh, and accompanying this quest for natural laws was the argument that Europe was the first place to realize these natural laws, to realize a form of modern life based on natural laws, which themselves were based on rationality, which were based on science, uh, and were hostile to things like superstition and religion. Uh, but this idea then that Enlightenment thinkers argued that there were these things called natural laws, and Europe uh, was the home of these natural laws, created an argument that suggested to people around the world that the only way to become modern was to follow the European example, that there was a single path to modern living, and it led through European norms, European uh, ideals. Uh, and this is something ultimately that I'll talk about a little bit later on, that the Japanese, including government leaders, military leaders, uh, cultural figures, intellectuals, were also fighting against. The idea that the only way to be modern was to be Western. So let me first uh, uh, talk through some of these different enemies that Japan was fighting. Um, first then, let's turn to the United States. Uh, and here we have images uh, from uh, Japanese popular culture, um, uh, images of the leader of the United States during uh, most of the Pacific War from 1941 to 1945. Uh, we have uh, this image of Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And this is a very common image of FDR as representing what kind of enemy the United States was to Japan. Now here you can begin to see if you look uh, at different parts of this image, uh, FDR has this sort of evil grin. He has these kind of devilish uh, looking eyes and he has these large oversized, even grasping hands. Um, and this is in many ways how the Japanese saw the United States as a powerful but evil almost monstrous-like figure. Uh, and you see it also at work here in a slightly grainier image, but this too is an image of FDR, who is removing his human mask to show this more evil, monstrous-like figure that lurked beneath. Um, now, if we look at a different or another image uh, of FDR, we're gonna start to <coughs> see a little bit clearer definition of not just the evil part uh, that was associated with FDR in the United States, but the powerful part. Where was this power coming from? Um, so this is an image um, of FDR's face. And if you look at his uh, eyebrows and his nose, you can see that these are uh, cannons. Uh, his teeth are bullets. Uh, his, I guess you could call these airplane wrinkles uh, that are appearing uh, around and across his face, and his hair uh, is in the shape of battleships. So one of the things this is arguing is that the type of enemy that uh, the United States was, was not just an evil enemy, but who used military technology and their technological sophistication for evil ends. Um, now, this was not a new image of the United States. Uh, if you go back to the middle of the 19th century, when Commodore Matthew Perry, who was sent by Millard Fillmore to, in his words, open up Japan to foreign trade, 
uh, when he was sent to Japan and he arrived, the Japanese depicted him in a very similar way. Uh, you can notice here the kind of elongated nose that in this image has become uh, a cannon. You notice the sort of evil eyes as well. Uh, so this this idea of the United States and the figures who represented the United States as evil but powerful has a very long history. And that evil and that power being associated with Western military technology also accompanied Perry on his mission. This is an image of Perry's black ships, as they were called, these coal-powered smoke-belching ships that were intimidating emblems of Western technology. Uh, so when the United States and Japan were fighting uh, during the Pacific War, uh, this was a battle that was rooted in uh, almost a century long relationship between Japan and the United States that did contain this element of seeing the United States as a powerful but evil force that is trying to uh, dominate Japan to advance American interests. But I think, again, as I said earlier, simply focusing on the Pacific War as the dominant part of Japan's uh, experience of World War II misses some of the other battles that are being fought by Japan during the wartime years. And so for instance, the United States as an enemy in many ways represented a much broader battle that Japan and Japanese leaders felt they were fighting against Western imperialism, Western culture, and ultimately the enlightenment. So I wanna examine these overlooked enemies as a kind of window uh, into Japanese motivations for war. Uh, and here too, I want to really rely on visual culture. Uh, I myself, when I teach about modern Japan, find that students really respond to visual culture. Uh, and for then, any of you who are teachers in the audience, uh, I'll be sharing this PowerPoint uh, with you uh, so you can use some of this hopefully in your own classrooms uh, as well. So I want to talk about then the second enemy this broader enemy, not just the United States, but Western uh, imperialism. Uh, and here you see an image from a children's magazine during the wartime years that is trying to depict why Japan is fighting this war. Uh, and here uh, I wanna point out really three things, uh, three kind of themes or tropes that you see in this image that were repeated time and time again as Japan fought this war. So first of all, in this image, uh, the enemies are a powerful West who are looking on from the corners here, a kind of uh, almost Uncle Sam-like figure, again, with a kind of long nose, uh, and here a British figure uh, notice the big uh, urban metropolises in the background. They are looking over into this corner of the globe, wondering, in this case with worry, what's going on? Why are these Asians rising up against us? Um, so one thing that you really see clearly is that uh, uh, one of the enemies is uh, powerful Western nations. But you also begin to see how Japan is beginning to explain what they're doing in Asia by fighting this war. Uh, and one of the things they're doing in Asia, and you see it uh, in different images here, if you really focus in, there's a Japanese soldier uh, kicking out a British person from India down here as well in Southeast Asia. Here's the Japanese flag and a Japanese soldier who is expelling in this case, uh, an American. So one of the things that's being argued is that Japan is fighting this war to expel Western powers from across Asia. And in doing so, and this is the second or third important theme from this image, the Japanese are making alliances with 
Asian peoples. So you can see this in parts like here, uh, here as well. These are images of fraternity among and between Asian peoples, particularly between, between Japanese and other uh, Asian peoples. So starting in 1931, uh, which for Japan is when they first invaded Northeastern China uh, in an incident that's known as the Manchurian incident, uh, starting in, in 1931, Japan was beginning this process of liberating Asia from Western control, liberating Asian peoples, and then joining together with them in order to build uh, a new Asia. Now, I want to keep <clears throat> thinking a little bit more about this theme of the Japanese as liberators, because it's deeper and a little bit more complex than, than meets the eye. Um, if you look at another image, uh, a kind of political cartoon from the wartime era, uh, this is what's uh, liberation in Southeast Asia. You see the sun here in the background, which is radiating its power and strength and expelling in the bottom right corner, the Dutch uh, from Southeast Asia. But what I wanna focus on is this fraternity, this image of fraternity between a Japanese arm, because you can see the Japanese flag here, being extended out to uh, a person from Southeast Asia. Um, and one of the things I really wanna emphasize is that even though the Japanese uh, advertised themselves as liberators of Asians, that did not mean that they abandoned notions of hierarchy. Uh, and I think you really see that at work here. I think you see uh, that at work, for instance, uh, when you note the different skin tones, uh, the Japanese skin tone is much lighter compared to the darker skin tone of the person from Southeast Asia. And also uh, the clothing. The Japanese are clothed in what they consider to be modern garb, uh, whereas the person from Southeast Asia is, is uh, clothed in a kind of semi-clothed manner. So there's a suggestion here of not just fraternity, but also hierarchy, that Japan was going to be leading Asian peoples uh, together toward this goal of uh, the liberation of Asia. So there was fraternity in this notion of the Japanese as liberators, but there wasn't always equality. Uh, and I think that's an important thing to remember in Japan's battles against Western imperialism in Asia. Um, and it is true though that uh, the vision uh, of Japanese leaders as it evolved over uh, the 15 year war was increasingly ambitious. Uh, it wasn't simply liberating Northeast Asia or Southeast Asia, but it began to extend as this image of Asian solidarity and fraternity suggests all the way to uh, India and to other parts of South Asia. So this image here of a Japanese soldier with different populations within India is suggesting that uh, Japan's ambitions to unite Asia are broad, and they are expanding and they are dynamic, uh, but they are all uh, ultimately unifying together against a common enemy. Uh, and that is located here in another propaganda image. Um, this common enemy is the Western powers who are in Asia after all, simply to steal money and get rich. Um, so there was this slogan attached to the propaganda image that this is an apt time to expel the British from Asia. Uh, so Japan was uh, you know, quite ambitious in fighting this enemy of Western imperialism um, across the whole 15 year war period. Now, another part of fighting Western empires and Western peoples in Asia 
was beginning then to offer uh, an image or a vision of what would occur after that expulsion occurred, after the Japanese were able to expel uh, Westerners from Asia, what next? What sort of vision did the Japanese have to offer to Asian peoples? And here you begin to see it again in another image from popular culture. Uh, the argument went that in fighting Western imperialism, the Japanese were fighting to replace Western imperialism with a new order in East Asia. And that was captured by a very popular uh, slogan uh, during the wartime years that what Japan was endeavoring to do was to create the greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere. Um, that they were going to unite all Asians together. And by uniting them, they were gonna move Asia toward this goal of prosperity for all. So in this vision, there is a recognition then as this, uh, magazine cover suggests uh, a recognition of racial unity and Asian solidarity. Um, but at the same time, if you notice all the different garb, national garb that these people are wearing, implicit in this idea of a new order in East Asia was also an acknowledgement and even an embrace of ethnic difference. Uh, and this is something I'm going to return to uh, uh, in a minute to talk about it uh, in more detail. Uh, so this Greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere was uh, in some ways the twin to the goal of expelling Westerners uh, and Western imperialism from Asia. It was the twin because once you expelled the Westerners, you could build what was called at the time Asia for the Asians. Uh, and in this vision of building Asia for the Asians, one of the populations that was mobilized to uh, symbolize this new vision of the future, not surprisingly, was children. Children played a key role in propaganda posters because they were supposed to represent the future that Japan was fighting to realize. So here we have a series of uh, wartime images that are uh, displaying this idea of children representing the future, children embracing Asian fraternity. Um, so children are gonna begin to work together to bring, to bring uh, peace and prosperity to Asia. Now, one of the things that historians have started to pay attention to more about this uh, attempt to uh, um, create a new order in Asia is that Japanese rhetoric about building an empire in Asia often revolved around this idea of a multi-ethnic empire. Uh, it was not advertised, at least over time, as a product uh, and a project of assimilation. Uh, and this is where scholars argue that Japanese imperialism uh, is different in some ways from Western imperialism, because Japan, as a non-Western nation, uh, <clears throat> approached this whole issue of empire building in a somewhat different way. Now, Western imperialism, uh, at least rhetorically, uh, was an argument about carrying out what was called at the time a civilizing mission. That the goal of Western powers was to civilize the uncivilized people of the world. And there was a very strong assimilationist impulse. The goal was to make these people ultimately more European because Europe was considered the apex of civilization. Now, it's certainly the case that an assimilationist impulse was present in the Japanese case. It was not entirely absent. But alongside this goal of assimilation was also something you don't really see as much, if at all, 
in the case of Western imperialism, a desire to create a multi-ethnic empire uh, and multi-ethnic unity. Uh, so again, in, in a lot of these images here, and also if you go back here, uh, you see that these peoples are being represented in their national or ethnic uh, garb that is, is, is common to their region uh, of Asia. So this whole idea of building a multi-ethnic empire uh, is not something you see as much in uh, Western imperialism. And that is related to something I'll talk about in a minute, uh, uh, which is uh, ultimately related to Japan's goal to rethink the ideals of the enlightenment that Europe spread around the world. Um, okay, so, so far uh, I've talked about the United States and the type of enemy they were. I've talked about the second enemy, which is Western imperialism and the goals to expel Westerners from uh, Asia and to create this greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere. Now I wanna talk about the third enemy, which is Western culture. So the goal of Japan's wartime efforts was not simply to expel Western people from Asia, uh, and also particularly Japan, but to expel uh, Western culture and Western influence from Japan. Um, and here you see two images, one a photograph, one uh, uh, a propaganda image uh, that get at this goal, this, this third goal of purging Japan of Western culture and Western influence. So on the left, we see a Japanese woman who is combing from her hair. Uh, and it's, it's impossible for you to, to make it out, but you'll just have to trust me here. Um, that they're combing, this woman is combing from her hair, Anglo-American ideals. And some of the Japanese characters that are here and here are things like liberalism or individualism or money worship or materialism. These are elements of Western culture that Japanese wartime uh, ideologues identified as things in need of removal from Japan. So one of the big slogans with uh, regard to this effort of expelling Western culture, or one of the key terms uh, when you translate it from Japanese is purification. That this is a goal that is attempting to purify Japan. Uh, and in order to do that, Western culture needs to be uh, expelled. And that then produced probably what is the most famous wartime slogan in Japan, which appears here in this photograph, um, you know, which was on a, a public street, uh, Zeitaku wa tekida. Uh, and that means luxury is the enemy. So the enemy is not just the United States, the enemy is not just Western imperialism, it's also these Western values, that th these need to be seen as enemies as well, and we need to find ways to purge Japan of them. So this was seen as a kind of battle between two different cultures, a Western culture that it's made its way into Japan and what ideologues increasingly came to identify as Japanese culture. And this produced some very interesting products of popular culture. So here, uh, and when you get the PowerPoint, you'll be able to actually click the link. Um, uh, but here is a short uh, film, uh, which I won't play any of it now, um, which is basically a film in which evil Mickey attacks Japan. So this is Mickey Mouse, who is supposed to represent the United States uh, and uh, Western values, who is fighting against Momotaro, the Japanese peach boy from Japanese folklore and Japanese fables. So this is a battle then between not just the United States and Japan, but Western culture and Japanese culture. And the goal then is to rid Japan of this Western culture. But this too begs the question, 
<laughs> of once you kick out this Western culture, what will you replace it with? And during the wartime years, uh, the argument went that it will be replaced with a revived and strengthened version of Japanese culture and Asian culture. Uh, so let me spend a little bit of time thinking about that question. What do we do with all this Western culture? <clears throat> so the goal here was to remove Western versions of modern culture. And here we're starting to get into arguments about the fourth enemy, the enlightenment. Because as I explained at the beginning of the talk, enlightenment thinkers, and many Japanese thinkers in the modern era embraced enlightenment uh, ideas, argued that there was a single path to modern culture, that you had to follow the Western example. And if you took that path, ultimately, a country like Japan could uh, ultimately realize modern culture and become a modern nation. Now, um, you can see then there's a real hostility in Japan at this time towards uh, Western versions of modern culture. Uh, because one of the things Japanese thinkers are beginning to argue and this is related to the Enlightenment, is that you can separate Western culture from modern culture. That there is such a thing as a universal modern culture, but there are multiple paths to the modern. So they're starting to reject the argument that there's only one path to becoming modern, and that is the path that forces you to imitate Western example. Wartime thinkers began to reject that argument. And part of that rejection was saying, there is this thing called Western uh, culture, and it is modern, but it's not the only form of modern culture. So in the war time years, what we have to do is remove the Western versions of modern culture. So you'll get sentiments then such as, the existence of dance halls and dance schools, which is seen as particularly Western, rebel against our national conditions, disturb womanhood, encourage frivolity in our youth, and exert not a little bad influence on the nation's public morality. So one argument went that we have to remove Western versions of, cult, of uh, modern culture, but then it needs to be replaced by a Japanese version of modern culture. So the argument is being built that there is a Japanese path or an Asian path to modern culture that doesn't go through the Western example. And we are fighting this war to show that that's possible. And that was a very important argument because these people then felt if you can make that happen, then you destroy the whole enlightenment notion that the only way to become modern is to become uh, is to follow the Western example. So they begin, you begin to see this argument that you need to create Japanese versions of modern culture. Uh, and that produces sentiments, uh, wartime sentiments, such as our present mission as a people is to build up a new Japanese culture by adopting and sublimating Western cultures within our national polity as the basis and to contribute spontaneously to the advancement of world culture. Now, I think some of this maybe a little bit more abstract uh, argument that I'm putting here will become more concrete uh, when I think about uh, something that went on during the wartime years, and that is the search for an Asian-style chair. Uh, so the argument during the wartime years was that the chair as an implement is a modern implement, but <laughs> there are different versions of modern chairs. There are Western versions of modern chairs, but we can discover an Asian style chair, a Japanese style chair that is equally modern, but is different from the Western style chair. And so you get quotations then during the wartime era for people who are trying to accomplish this saying like, Japan must have Japanese chairs. 
And by extension, there must be Asian chairs. Is it acceptable then that products continue indefinitely to be second or even third rate inferior imitations of European chairs? We must advance to reform not only chairs, but also desks and shelves, and indeed the entire space of daily life. So there is this goal then of creating a new culture of daily life that is modern, but that is also undeniably Asian. Um, so you begin to have a movement then to create this culture of daily life and implements of daily life that are built by Asian hands with Asian materials according to an Asian style. And this is where it's quite interesting because a lot of this rhetoric is related to Japanese wartime efforts to build an empire in Asia and to build a greater East Asian co-prosperity sphere. Because the people who are arguing that we need to build an Asian style chair in Japan, one of the arguments they make is that Japan has become too westernized. We've lost track of Asian sensibilities and Asian style. And where is that? Where are we going to find out about that? Where are we going to reclaim our roots in Asia? Well, it's going to be our colonies, because those places have served as a storehouse of Asian culture. They have not been as excessively westernized as Japan. So Asian ideals, Asian values, Asian style has been preserved in our colonies. And what our work is, is to excavate from our Asian colonies uh, the inspiration for a new culture of daily life. So the colonies are seen as a place of national rejuvenation for Japan. And these Asia then, more broadly, is seen as a laboratory for reform, for creating this Asian style chair, for creating this Asian style culture of daily life, and for even creating Asian style modernity. And in the colonies then, where you have this laboratory for reform, things will be discovered and then brought back to help change Japan, to help Japan become once again the leader of. Asia. So this idea then of colonies as a source of rejuvenation for the, for the home country, that's not as present in Western imperialism, but it is in Japanese imperialism. So this is just a way to get us to think about uh, how the wartime efforts was not just to fight against uh, Western culture, but also to fight against the Enlightenment. So let me just summarize this part before I move on to the U.S. side. Um, so I've been arguing here that Japan's wartime years were an attempt to overcome Western influence and to build a new world in East Asia. It was a world in which you were going to renovate Asia by expelling Western people, culture, and power. And then you were going to strengthen Japan through its connection with the primal spirit of Asia, which resided in its colonies. Japan was going to guide Asia to a new form of the modern, that was both modern and Asian. And by doing that, Asia was gonna become autonomous, prosperous, and united in fraternity. And this would ultimately be a successful war against imperialism and also the enlightenment. Now, I, I wanna get to the US side, so I just have a quick slide here that reminds you of the reading that Yumi sent you, uh, the case of Tanizaki Junichiro, who himself was struggling to realize this dream of imagining a world in which you could have an East Asian modern. So perhaps in the question and answer, we can talk a little bit more uh, about this. But I wanna switch sides, so to speak, and think about the enemy from the American perspective. So up until now, we've been thinking about who were the enemies that Japan was fighting. And now I want to switch perspectives because this will relate to your later workshop on who was the Japanese enemy from the American perspective. And here I think, again, things like political cartoons, propaganda posters, 
animated cartoons are all very revealing windows into who Americans thought the enemy was. And the theme I wanna develop here in thinking about American views of the Japanese enemy is themes of race, racial hierarchies and racial motivations for war. Uh, scholars have argued over the last few decades that this is a crucial but often overlooked element of the war between the United States and Japan. So let me look, let's look at a few images here from the wartime years from the US side. Uh, so here we have a wartime poster that says Alaska, death trap for the Jap. Uh, and this is a very common image of the Japanese portrayed as rats, as animals. So they're not being portrayed as humans. They're being portrayed here as rats, which is something that needed to be exterminated. Um, obviously, one of the things that's going on here is dehumanization, dehumanization of the enemy. And this is something that is common across modern wars in the 19th and 20th century. But it's not just dehumanization. It's also what you might call sub humanization, that the Japanese are consistently portrayed as less than human, as not quite fully evolved as a human race and a human species. And you see that much more clearly in this cover of Time magazine from the wartime years that portrays the Japanese as monkey men. Uh, <clears throat> this idea of the Japanese as monkeys drew on Darwinian scientific theory. The idea that monkeys are not fully evolved humans. And then by extension, the argument is the Japanese are not a fully evolved race. So in this image, we see embedded in it Western science and the notions of hierarchy that are implicit in Western science. The idea is our enemy is not quite fully evolved. They're not quite a fully evolved species or race, and that is who we are fighting against. Now, uh, in the course of the war, especially uh, in early 1942, uh, Japan did win a number of crucial battles, and that shocked Westerners, shocked Americans, but oddly enough, it didn't really change the depictions of the Japanese. I mean, they did change from this somewhat smaller version of a monkey to uh, a kind of King Kong-like figure, a gorilla-like figure. But again, they were consistently dehumanized. And some scholars argue that the reason the Japanese were regularly portrayed as monkeys was to put the Japanese back in what was considered to be their proper racial place which is subordinate to the white races. And that one of the reasons the United States is fighting this war is to reconstruct a racial hierarchy that seemed to be under attack by the Japanese attacks on the United States and the Japanese attacks on Western imperial powers in Asia. Uh, so the United States and other uh, Western powers are fighting this war to maintain and to reestablish a Western dominated, arguably white dominated world order that had been put in place all the way back in the 1700s. Uh, so one of the images of the Japanese is this dehumanized image, uh, this monkey-like image. Uh, some other images of the Japanese are the comical and the scary. And I think this uh, also gives us insight into how Americans viewed Japan. So for the comical, you see in this uh, cartoon here, a very regular depiction of the Japanese, someone who needed to wear glasses, who had buck teeth, who had a kind of pug nose. Uh, this was a comical figure that suggested a strain of thinking in America that almost was incredulous. How could this small country be able to attack us and think they were gonna win. That is, is truly comical, that's laughable. So there was that strain of thinking about the Japanese enemy, but there was also another strain of thinking, and that is scary. 
that Japan was fighting an extended war with the United States and the war was not short and it didn't end quickly. And the longer it went on, the longer it seemed possible that Japan might win this war. So here we have this image of the scary Japanese. Uh, here, I think very tellingly, playing on gender stereotypes as well, uh, what seems truly threatening is if a Japanese man somehow threatens an American woman. So this is the enemy. This is the scary Japanese. Um, and it's not just the leaders of Japan who are depicted in this way. This is another Time Magazine uh, image that is in some ways trying to capture the whole swath of the Japanese population. And to say our enemy is not just the leaders of Japan, but the entire population of Japan. And you can see they're all depicted very similarly with buck teeth, uh, pug noses, glasses. Um, so this is just another image of this kind of comical, at the same time, scary enemy, this whole nation that we're fighting against. And it's not just the nation of Japan. It's also extended in the United States, as I'm sure you'll talk about in your workshop, to Japanese Americans. Uh, and this is an image uh, that was created by the man who came to be known as Dr. Seuss. He was a very active uh, cartoonist during the wartime years, uh, and he produced a series of uh, uh, cartoons and wartime images that were very influential and very revealing of American ideas about Japan and American ideas about Japanese Americans. So I just picked one, but there's a whole book uh, that I borrowed the title from here of Dr. Seuss Goes to War, uh, uh, written and edited by Dick Minear, Richard Minear, a historian of Japan, uh, for any of you who are interested in finding more cartoons that Dr. Seuss created. But here we have a very revealing image, um, which is Japanese Americans all lined up up and down the West Coast, from Washington to Oregon to California. They are referred to as the Honorable Fifth Column they're collecting their, their dynamite, their TNT, and they're waiting for the signal from home. So this is another image of the Japanese as an untrustworthy people who are, despite being Japanese Americans, ultimately blood nationalists, that they are most dedicated and devoted to the land where they were born or the land where their ancestry lies, and that is in Japan. Um, now, this kind of imagery uh, went beyond political cartoons to actual um, uh, you know, animated cartoons. And in the PowerPoint, I'm sharing with you a couple of or three uh, links to three cartoons from the wartime era. Uh, one, a Superman cartoon, one, a Looney Tunes cartoon, and one, a Tokyo Tokyo cartoon that all depicts who the Japanese enemy was, at least through uh, American eyes. Uh, so that's just a kind of quick overview of the American perspective on the Japanese enemy. Uh, and I'm sure, again, in your workshop after this, you'll go into more detail about that. So I think my time is just about up. So I wanted to thank you uh, and also to field questions and discussion. So thank you very much for listening. Uh, and I look forward to engaging in a back and forth with you about some of these ideas.